Are you looking for inspiring conversations about faith, film, and life? You're in the right place. Here's the host who knows the right questions to ask, Father Edward Looney. Hey, everybody. It's Father Edward, and I'm delighted to be having a conversation with an author that I've known for a number of years now. We got to know each other through the Catholic Writers Guild. We've been at different Catholic events together together. And uh, just, uh, I'm sure, a delightful conversation that we are about to have. She has written a number of books. She's written some books of fiction. Uh, She has written some uh, nonfiction works as well. And uh, she has a doctorate in education. And uh, I'm speaking today with Dr. Amy Catapan. And so thankful that you're with me to talk a little bit about education and saints and kind of your experience in the classroom, because I'm a new pastor of a Catholic school. Um, obviously, the school's been there a long time. I'm new, and uh, it's my first time with a school. But, I, I, you know, I had a good initiation in the first nine months of being in the parish. And, you know, the school is really a blessing. That is for sure. So thanks so much, Amy, for joining me. Well, thank you for having me on, Father Edward. Always a pleasure to have a conversation about you. We have a lot of things in common, so I'm sure we're going to find a few different things to talk about today. Yeah, most definitely. And, uh, you know, you too also kind of have a podcast. You do interviews with book authors. It started with um, Shalom World Television and then kind of just morphed independently on your own. But it's just a way for you to spotlight indie authors too. You know, maybe people that don't have a, a big background with marketing behind them from a company. And so so it's a nice little platform that you're running there too. So um, all good things. And uh, you have a new book out and you, you had a book a year or two ago called Sweet Jesus, Is It June Yet? And, uh, and so I've been thinking about that because, you know, it's April and almost April. And when we're recording, it will be April when this releases. And uh, we're just going to spring break. And I just have taken on the responsibility of teaching religion for a quarter. So, so I will be saying, sweet Jesus is at May 20th, you know, because we ended <laughs> May. So, but uh, it'll be good. Uh, looking forward to the challenge and the opportunity and just uh, to, you know, it's, it, it's great to have that Catholic presence in the classroom and to have, you know, a clerical presence, I think too, uh, a priest uh, in the classroom. Yeah. So I, I um, think they're very lucky to have you coming in and teaching religion. You're going to get those junior high kids. They're going to keep you on your toes, father. Yeah, I'm going to learn a lot, I think. So so tell me uh, tell me the inspiration behind Sweet Jesus, Is It June Yet? Like, yeah. uh, it, it deals with teacher burnout. And I think people deal with burnout all, you know, in all different careers mm-hmm. uh, that we can take too much on. People would say, I take too much on, <laughs> you know, so, so that, uh, but why that book? And why did you feel compelled to write that first book for teachers? Well, I have a feeling, Father, that, um, there, well, there's a saying in the fiction world that you write the book you want to read. And I feel like in the nonfiction book, you write the book you need to read. So I wrote the book basically out of necessity. I was teaching middle school full time and I was in the middle of my doctoral program. And I got to about this time of the school year, right before spring break. And I was feeling so burned out from the whole thing. I actually considered... Um, not finishing my doctoral program. I was so tired of you know teaching all day and then going to classes at night and grading papers in between classes and, and then having to do my own homework for the program that I thought, oh, do I even finish this? And I decided to do what anyone who's Jesuit educated like I am and is uh, very familiar with Ignatian spirituality, I decided I'm going to go away on retreat and I'm going to pray about this. I'm going to go do some good old Ignatian style discernment. So I actually signed up to do a five-day silent retreat at a Jesuit retreat house outside of Atlanta. But before I even left, like the week before, I remember sitting down in prayer at home and thinking, okay, I don't know what I'm going to do for five days on a silent retreat. I had done a weekend silent retreat a couple of times, but what am I going to do on this five days? And how am I going to pray for discernment? And in that prayer, I just had a little thought kind of flutter through my mind about writing a book about teaching like Jesus. And I was kind of like, well, what, first of all, what does that mean? Mm. And second, I didn't see myself as a nonfiction writer at that point. I just saw myself as a novelist, you know, writing children's 
um, and you know, young adult novels. And I thought, well, I guess that gives me something now to pray about in the retreat. Mm. So I went into that five day silent retreat and, you know, I met with a spiritual director and I said, okay, I think my plan is just to read through the gospel of Mark and read it through the lens of Jesus as a teacher, right? He was called a rabbi because rabbi means teacher. Um, he had his students, the apostles. So what can I learn from looking at him as a teacher? And so that's what I did over the course of that five day silent retreat. I just slowly and prayerfully read through the gospel of Mark and looked at Jesus as a teacher and how he responded to his students. And by the end of that retreat, I actually had a whole outline for what ended up becoming Sweet Jesus Is It June yet. So it's a very, um, it's a rather Ignatian style kind of reflection on the gospel stories, but through a particular lens what can we learn from Jesus as a teacher? Um, and so that one came out a couple of years ago now from Ave Maria Press. So isn't it interesting? You went on a retreat to discern if you wanted to finish your doctoral studies <laughs> and you did finish your doctoral study. So yeah. I guess that answer was yes. But then the Lord said, but I want you to do that. And here's <laughs> another thing. And here you are writing about burnout or something like that. So, and so here you are like all these little projects, right? But, but that's, I guess sometimes the Lord gives those callings to the people that he knows that are ready and willing and able to respond. Right. I'm thinking I have too many projects on my plate and the Lord's like, and here's another one. <laughs> Yeah, I feel that sometimes, you know, like, because I'll get inspired with like, oh, you know, I should put this in the future things to think about, write about, work on, whatever, you know. So mm -hmm. um, I took like a year off from writing, but I guess I realized in that time, though, I finished because I was like you. I had a degree that was outstanding. I had to write the thesis. The problem was I chose my thesis topic like back in 20, uh, 2014. And so yeah. I really wasn't interested in the topic anymore. But in 2014, 2015, I had amassed and collected all of the resource, scanned everything. Like I had everything at my disposal. And like for me to like pitch a new topic and to go through that process mm -hmm. and everything like that, it just seemed like too much. And, yeah. and I'm like, I just need to sit down. And, and in the meantime, when I was supposed to be writing this thesis, I'd written two books. <laughs> So, so it's like, I could have been working on this thesis, but because it wasn't calling my name and I wasn't invested in it, I was financially, but not like in the topic, I guess. But, uh, you know, so, so I ended up finishing the project. It's like, you just do that and then everything else you can, you know, you can do it too. So, um, yeah, I, I guess I understand that. So what was the topic of your doctoral work then? Oh, that one was engendering empathy for immigrants in middle grade readers through culturally relevant young adult literature. So again, staying at my roots with, because um, I'm a middle school English teacher, staying at my roots with young adult middle grade books um, and how they can engender empathy because we, there's lots of studies out there already that say people who read more tend to be more empathetic because they can imagine themselves in the shoes of lots of different characters. And so I was looking at how reading historical fiction with immigrant characters would affect students who were studying immigration from more of a historical perspective in say their social studies class. So I was looking at the reading class component of a multidisciplinary unit that some eighth graders were doing. Yeah, so Sweet Jesus is a Juniat. That was your first te te book for teachers. In a sense, mm -hmm. it's kind of like the spirituality of teaching, extracting it from Jesus, encouraging uh, teachers um, to, to teach like Jesus. And so, so then you have the second book for teachers that comes out, A Saint Squad for Teachers. And um, how did that book come to be? Where was the, the germ of inspiration for that? Because again, it's kind of like a spirituality book because yeah. we, we all need intercessors. We need inspiration. So we need the saints to inspire us and to intercede for us. So, so I'm sure it probably came from your own spiritual life that maybe you're like, these are the three saints I've been praying to. And then, and then maybe it just kind of evolved from there. Well, once again, it really started from a need. So um, I wrote Sweet Jesus as a Junior, like half of it before the pandemic, finished it up during the pan the early part of the pandemic. And, you know, that was great to have that inspiration. I often went back to it myself during those uh, difficult months. But then as we were even coming out of it, 
I was still finding teaching very hard, right? There's still a lot of post-pandemic challenges. Some things related to the pandemic, but some things just in the way our society has evolved or devolved maybe recently with, you know, the way that we're so polarized and um, you were so screen addicted. There's still a lot of challenges in the classroom. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I can remember praying maybe a year or so after Sweet Jesus came out and thinking, okay, Lord, you know, this is great, but I need more. And, you know, the little scene that was playing in my head um, was actually from the old Star Trek episodes because I've got four brothers, three older, one younger. I was exposed to a lot of Star Trek and a lot of Star Wars growing up in the <laughs> 80s. And um, I could hear that little line that's, you know, often quoted um, where Captain Kirk is, I don't know, asking for the ship to go faster. And the engineer, Scotty, is saying back in his lovely Scottish accent that he's got to have more power, Captain, right? And I kept thinking, Lord, I've got to have more power or grace or something. Like, I, mm. I need more more school's still really hard the book on jesus was great lord what else have you got for me it was kind of my prayer and what ended up happening was actually a number of books on saints kind of appeared in my life i was at a pauline bookstore that we used to have here in chicago and i saw a saint devotional book and then some other saint books started coming up in my life and as i was reading through some of these i was realizing just how many saints there were who were either patron saints in education or had been teachers for a while. Like mm. I hadn't realized that St. Augustine of Hippo actually taught rhetoric, right? We oh, think of him as a preacher, but he was, That's right. he was a teacher of rhetoric and he got frustrated with his students. He thought the boys were undisciplined. So he actually like left one town and went to another town to see if he could find a better group of boys to teach there and then found the boys there weren't any better. So he left and he went to another one. And it was suddenly like some of these saints that I didn't have much of a connection with we're suddenly becoming so much more relatable. Um, and I was also discovering a lot of saints who are, or a lot of, I should say, a lot of like servants of gods and blessings are on their way oh. through the canonization process who were educators in the last century or two. So people who are not too far removed from our time period, some some people whose lifespans overlapped my own, you know, like um, servants of God, Sister Thea Bowman, right? Uh, there's a lot of... Uh, kind of up and coming saints, if you will, uh, who were also classroom educators. And I thought, you know, there's something here. If I can look at their lives and see how they made it through their, their teaching years, whether they were in the classroom all their lives or part of their lives, you know, maybe I can find some inspiration. And then in addition to being a source of inspiration, like you were saying, there are intercessors now, right? There, as the subtitle of the book says, are 45 heavenly friends to carry you through the school year, right? Ones mm. that we can kind of count on. Um, and I know I do every morning before school starts, before the kids walk into my room, as I may be straightening up the desks or getting things in order, I'm praying for their intercession. However, many of them come to mind that morning, if there's one in particular that I need, or if there's several that are coming to mind, asking them to watch over me and my students during the school day. So it's nice to know we can kind of go into our classroom and, and not be alone. We've got a squad behind our, behind our back supporting us. So Joseph and Mary, they're teachers of the Christ child. Do you feature them? I, I did not put Mary and Joseph in here. You know, there I think are, that's a good call though. It, it, would, it, it would definitely fit, but there's so many. I mean, there are some fairly obvious choices that I ended up like not putting in here um, just because I wanted to make sure I also had as diverse of a group as I could. Sure. And that I also had a, a different little mini lesson I could take from each of them. Sure, so sure. Makes in sense. the book, you get like a little biography and then you get a few little takeaways for each one. And I wanted to make sure that I had a variety in there. Yeah. How about Angela Marici? Just curious. Is she in there? She's a, she's good. She, she's, no, she's she not. Didn't make she's the cut. The, she didn't make the cut. I'm afraid. Well, that's okay. She's just one that immediately comes to mind uh, only because like I, I've studied a little bit of her life and such. So, but you know, I, I'm willing to bet mother Cabrini is in yes. the Saint squad and uh, mother Cabrini is probably in your personal Saint squad. So not just yeah. kind of this, this general, concept of saint squad as you write for teachers but like in your own personal life i think mother cabrini has touched you a little bit huh yeah well we have a lot of common um we're both uh petite women i'm five two she was five feet 
um, both Italian American. You know, she was obviously born in Italy, but she became a U.S. citizen. That's how she ended up becoming the first um, American canonized saint. Um, I'm Italian on my dad's side. Um, both of us uh, public school teachers. A lot of people don't realize oh, she wow. actually started as a public school teacher in Italy. She wanted to join some convents, but her health was not good enough, and she was rejected from a few. So she became a public school teacher in Italy for a while. Um, before, you know, starting her own order of sisters. Um, both of us have strong Jesuit ties. She took her religious name from St. Francis Xavier, the Jesuit missionary. Um, I'm twice Jesuit educated between Marquette, um, up in your home state there of Wisconsin, and then Loyola Chicago for my doctorate. Um, so I have a, a good background in Ignatian spirituality. Ignatian spirituality was very important to her and she would lead her, you know, her sisters through Ignatian style prayer and, and, and encourage them to go off on retreats and, and she would take time for retreats as well. So yeah, I have, I've felt, um, since researching her from this book in particular, a strong, uh, you know, affinity to her. Um, and really enjoyed getting to know more about her. I know you and I, not not together, but we've both visited the shrine to Mother Cabrini in that Chicago. is here in Chicago. Yeah, which is a beautiful place for anybody in the Chicago I think area. I recommended it to you because because I was just very moved yeah. by uh, by that place. And I love going back there. So, uh, of course, there's a, a new movie that was in theaters recently about Mother Cabrini. What were your thoughts, takeaways uh, on the film? Yeah, I'm sure you and I could spend a long time talking about it as, as Mother Cabrini fans seeing the movie. Well, my first thing is I would recommend for people to go and see it. I know there's been some talk out there about, mm. oh, it's not Catholic enough. I've seen it twice. And I, the first time I saw it, I had two things in my mind going in. Um, one, all the background research I had done on Mother Cabrini and kind of my own expectations for how I thought they would portray her and then two I was seeing it early to write a review for catholicmom.com so then you know you're kind of going in with the, like your reviewer cap on right you're like kind of coming with this mindset of what am I going to say in my review and, and trying to remember everything and so while I enjoyed it the first time there were some things I'm like hmm of course, as a writer who studied Mother Cabrini, I probably would have changed a few things, right? Sure. Um, and the second time I was able to kind of let go of my preconceived ideas and just enjoy it as, as a movie. Um, and the people I saw it with, because I saw it with a priest friend and three women the first time, and then two women friends the second time, and everybody loved it um, and, and were inspired by it. The thing that like I would have changed probably the most is I would have actually just probably changed a few lines to show what I talk about in my book. So in my book, kind of the angle I'm taking on Mother Cabrini is that she really relied on God's generosity, right? Whenever she wanted to start something new, a new school, a new orphanage, a new hospital, she believed that God would take care of things. Like she would pick out the building she wanted and her sisters would say, but mother, we don't have the money. That building's too expensive. And she would be like, God's going to provide. The money's going to come, right? When, uh, even before she came to America, when she was in Italy and she wanted to set up a school in Rome um, and to get her order approved, uh, she met with a cardinal and the cardinal wasn't quite so sure about whether or not she should start a school in Rome. And so he said, ask the Lord for a sign, ask for uh, 500,000 lira to show up and then we'll take it as a sign that you should be making a school. And they left from the meeting with the Cardinal and her sisters were nervous again. And she said, don't worry, the Lord's gonna change his heart. And sure enough, when she came back, she was told not to start one, but two schools in the area around Rome. So oh, wow, see. She, she had, yeah, she just had this trust that, the Lord was going to take care of things, right? And, you know, there's a couple of times in the movie she says something to the effect of, you know, start the mission and the means will come. And I was like, oh, if they had just changed that line to start the mission and the Lord will provide the means. Yeah, I'm like, that was I, the line I, think, I had right in my head. Yeah. Yeah. If they had just changed that little line, I think we would have gotten a little truer sense of her spirituality yeah. in the movie. Sure. Well, what were, uh, what it, were your thoughts? Uh, I kind of, uh, you know, I have similar thoughts. I thought that we could have portrayed, you know, 
I really, I love the fact that, you know, you have a non-Catholic company saying we want to tell the story of a Catholic saint. Like there's something there powerful to think about with that. Uh, at the same time, I just really, um, I thought if they could have just showed her as a woman of prayer and, and like somehow just exude a bit more Catholic identity in the film, that would have made a, a, a great story. It was good. Cinematically, it was great. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just thought it was lacking, as you kind of point out a little bit. So well, but I, I don't deter people from seeing it. I think go yeah. see it, but just just be prepared that this isn't the saint biography you want it to be. Yeah, well, the interesting is, the, I believe the writer, the uh, producers, like Eduardo Veresti, he's one of the producers, the director, um, they're all Catholic. And Angel Studios actually is just the distributor. Yeah. So yeah. I don't think they had anything to do with the creation of it, but more just getting it out there, which is what... Um, is it Alejandro? I think it, yeah, I think it's yeah. it's Alejandro Monteverde who's the um, director. I, I know they were like working on this with uh, a producer friend I think it's Eustace. Is that his name? Eustace something? Worthington, I think is his last name. Um, that they had wanted to do this project for a long, long time. And they kept putting it off because they didn't think they had a situation where they could um, get it really out there in movie theaters. And until they had the success with Sound of Freedom that they had, then they felt yeah. like, okay, now, now we can do this movie and we can do it justice. Yeah. And in the interviews I've seen, they've sort of made it clear the movie isn't like Catholics aren't their target audience. They're mm. hoping people who aren't Catholic will go see it. Um, and then want to go learn more about mother. Cabrera. Yeah. That was one of my takeaways that maybe you'll have non-Protestants seeking the intercession of saints, you know? Mm -hmm. So yeah, you know, it, 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 it's the film that's out there, you know, and, um, I, I don't think it was as successful as maybe they had hoped or anticipated. Their budget was fifty million, and so far they brought in maybe about twenty million at the box office. Of course, there will be other ways they they recoup expenses and such, but but in terms of the return on investment and the expense, I don't think it, they've met that, you know. But but uh, hopefully, it's a good sign for things to come in the future too. I know Angel Studios was looking at doing something for uh, on a Lutheran theologian named Bonhoeffer. So I think that's mm. coming here in the next year. Um, so there's other projects coming from Angel Studios for sure. Uh, but getting back to a Saint Squad for teachers, uh, you have 45 saints there, Mother Cabrini and your personal posse. Like who's somebody in the book that you can't wait for people to encounter meet because maybe they were new to you you enjoyed researching them or mm -hmm. someone whose story there that maybe is unfamiliar and they're gonna discover this person you hope that they'll be as moved by them as you were yeah somebody i really enjoyed getting to know better was sister thea bowman i oh, mentioned sure. her a little bit earlier um and all i really knew about her before i started researching her was that famous speech that she gave to the U.S. Catholic bishops back in, I think it was 1989, um, just shortly before she died. She was battling um, cancer at the time. And people can look that up on YouTube. It, it's a beautiful speech that she gives um, to the Catholic bishops. And I think a lot of people know her from that. But when I started digging into her life and reading other books about her, I found her life so much more um, inspirational than just that one speech. So she grew up in the South um, in the early part of the 20th century. I think she was born in like 1937. And she was the daughter of a doctor and a school principal. Her mom had been a teacher mm. and then a school principal. And her dad was Methodist. Her mom, I believe, was Episcopalian. So she was not raised Catholic. She was a convert? Okay. Yeah, she was a convert. And at the time, of course, that she was going to school, this would have been like the 1940s, schools were segregated down in the South where she uh, grew up in Mississippi. And even though her mom was a principal at the largest, I think it was the largest African-American school in the area, um, they knew their daughter was not being challenged. They knew she was bright and she was not getting quite the education that um, she needed. Because, you know, with segregation of schools, schools were not always funded well. So when the Sisters of Perpetual Adoration from La Crosse, Wisconsin, came down to Mississippi and started a school there, the Holy Child Jesus Mission School, uh, the Bowmans, or yeah, Dr. and Mrs. Uh, Bowman decided to sign her up. And so she was in the charter sixth grade class at Holy Child Jesus Mission School, and she thrived. 
she did so well there, but she also really fell in love with the Catholic faith. She sure. saw the joy that the priests and the sisters there had, and she was just so attracted to that. Not only did she become Catholic on her own, she went on a hunger strike at age 15 to convince mm. her parents to let her join the sisters. And they were not so you know, fond of the idea at first because it meant she was going to have to leave Mississippi as a teenage girl and go up to uh, Wisconsin, go up to La Crosse, Wisconsin, um, to, uh, join the, to join the order. And that's what she did. And as you can probably guess, she um, met with a bit of backlash, um, not just from the community, but from the sisters themselves, because she was the first African-American to try to join the order. And some people weren't so sure about that. But Sister Thea Bowman, even at a young age, she had such a joy about her as well and um, lovely Southern charm that she eventually won over the sisters. She thrived under their tutelage. They realized just like her mom and dad had that she was a bright young woman and they decided she would make an excellent teacher. So they trained her as a teacher and then she got her first job teaching up there in the area. And once again, there was pushback. Some parents weren't too sure they wanted this young African-American nun teaching their children. Um, but the principal was wise and they knew if these parents just met her and got to know her that they would feel differently about her. So she arranged for a meeting with the parents and Sister Thea. And of course, she won over everybody again with her Southern charm and her joy. And then eventually she was able to come back. She kind of got her dream job. She came back and was a teacher at her own school at Holy mm. Child Jesus Mission School. And she taught at all the levels. She taught at elementary school. She taught at the high school level. She went on for a master's and a doctorate in English. So she ended up teaching at the college level. She was one, one of the founding faculty members for the Institute for Black Catholic Studies at Xavier University in Louisiana. So she really kind of covered the whole gamut of education. And um, when her parents fell ill and she ended up being diagnosed with cancer, she still very gallantly went on and kept teaching as much as she could and speaking as much as she could. Um, and I think she's just a, a beautiful role model on a number of things. Um, I write in the book about how she struggled with her high school boys and trying to get them to read, right? High school boys were not wanting to get into novels, but she found out they liked comic strips. So she used that as like an in. She had them write essays about the characters in comic strips. And I just keep thinking about like how if she was teaching nowadays, she would probably use graphic novels as the in to get those reluctant readers pulled into reading and then you know getting them to read more and more. She also was great about using music in her lessons. She was a singer herself and she directed a 50 member choir with students and even recorded an album of African-American spirituals. Um, so just the way that she was able to bring such joy and fun into our classroom, I think it's a great reminder that we can do the same in our classrooms too. So Father, when you're teaching religion, this quarter, you can be thinking about how can you incorporate some music into your lessons? <laughs> sure. Well, we'll figure something out. So um, I have a few ideas uh, where I think we should be going uh, with those lessons. But uh, yeah, so I, I brought home all the all the book, the, the curriculum, you know, just to take a look and see what it is we could be doing, all that. So, um, you know, so this book, uh, A Saint Squad for Teachers, uh, available from Ave Maria Press, that you've written, you said it features 45. We've only talked about two of those people. So is it, what, what's your intention? Like people could sit down, they read three or four at a time. Is it like set out to be almost like a, a daily devotional for a teacher? Like, you know, one a day for 45 days. Like what's your vision for, for the educator who might pick up this book? Yeah. So there's a couple different ways to tackle it. In fact, um, there's a free um, reader's discussion guide that if it's not already up on the Ave Maria Press site, I'm sure it will be soon. And in that um, free discussion guide, in case people want to do it as like a book club study or a faculty study, um, I lay out a couple different plans for how people can tackle it. Uh, the book is divided into 10 chapters that are based on themes. So oh. like there's saints who used relatable and creative teaching techniques. There's saints who built strong relationships saints who dealt with challenging students, saints who advocated for Seems change. Seems like a book I need. Yeah, yeah. 
you might find a lot of St. Friends in here. Um, and so with the 10 chapters, you know, if say like a faculty wanted to do it as a faculty book club study, they could do like one chapter uh, a month, basically in the school year um, and get it done in the course of a school year. Um, if somebody was doing it on their own, they might want to take just one saint a week. And I think I have a plan in there as well where you can kind of break it down into like the 36 weeks of the school year and do just like maybe one or two okay. saints a week. Um, the biographies and the reflections, because with each saint, there's like a biography that's probably a page or two, and then maybe two or three bulleted points afterwards of my reflection of like the takeaways for that one. You know, you could read that in like five minutes in the morning while you're doing your morning prayer and having your cup of coffee or something, if people sure. wanted to break it down into a daily devotional like that too. And then you could be done in about 45 days. <laughs> well, pastors, principals out there, I think this is a great book. Uh, maybe for the end of the year, maybe for the beginning of the year to set the tone for like a spiritual tone could be a Christmas gift. There are lots of different ways that a parish could actually gift this book and enrich uh, the lives of the teachers in Catholic education. But also this is a book meant for teachers in public schools, right? Like yeah. they need inspiration. They need intercessors. They need heavenly help and they can turn Absolutely. to these people too. So yeah, um, also, yeah there's a uh, lot there. I would say also catechists and youth ministers, because some of the saints in here are actually the patron saints of catechists, um, like St. Charles Borromeo is in here as well. So anyone who does any kind of teaching or evangelizing, I think we'll find some friends in this book. Well, how wonderful. Well, this is a great resource. I know that I'm going to be picking up a copy as I cross the threshold of a classroom to teach for like six weeks so <laughs> and you know what and who knows maybe this will evolve into maybe i should teach religion every every year you know who knows what this could potentially bring about so you you might start something i know there's the associate pastor at my parish she goes in once a week to teach religion so there is a another regular religion teacher but once a week he takes over and he comes and he does a guest spot so oh, even sure. he's doing a little bit of teaching in there yeah, that's wonderful. Well, Amy, how can people find you online? You're doing a lot of stuff. You have socials, you have a website, yeah. uh, you have other projects. So what what are those links and uh, where can they find you? Sure. So my website is ajcatapan.com because that's how I started with my children's books was using my initials for my pen name. So ajcatapan.com, which is also the name you can find me under on um Facebook, on Instagram, um, YouTube. As you mentioned before, I have my Catholic live show where I interview authors with new books releasing. Um, and the book you can pick up on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, or Ave Maria Press. And there are bulk order opportunities. So if there's a pastor or a school principal or a DRE listening who's like, hey, I'd like to get this or Sweet Jesus is a June yet, um, give me, you know, drop me a line and I'll get you the information for a little bulk order discount for you. Well, it's great to have a teacher helping out other teachers, especially when it comes to the spiritual life. So you're doing great work, Dr. Amy Catapan. So thank you so much for joining me on the podcast today to talk about, first of all, Sweet Jesus is a Juniet and also a Saint Squad for teachers. Go over to uh, Ave Maria Press and you can get those books. So thanks so much, Dr. Amy. Thank you for having me on, Father Edward. If you liked today's episode, be sure to subscribe, rate, and review wherever you're listening. And don't forget to stay up to date with what Father Edward is doing by following him on Facebook, X, or Instagram at the handle at FR Edward Looney. Thanks for listening, and please join Father Edward again next time for another inspiring conversation.